everyone is ready for the recording. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. We've got a nice fall morning. It's finally starting to feel like fall. As I had mentioned, we've got two guests with us this morning. We have Dave with us. That's a new picture, isn't it? No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we look the same, Dave. Hasn't aged a bit. We've also got Sheila with us. I don't know where Sheila is. She's trying to get the key out of the closet that we got stuck in there this morning. And we have new agents joining us. We have Lexi over here joining us. She's to my left. Lexi just joined us from coming out of college, passing the real estate test. And guess where Lexi is from? Guess. <laughs> oh, it's a fan favorite here. <laughs> yeah. And we know people from Jersey. It's not. Maggie We make it a fan favorite, Lexi. And we thought Lexi would hold the rank of youngest in the office, but we just determined Justin is online this morning. You can see him on there. He's in the airport, actually. But Justin is younger than Lexi, so he's still holding rank at youngest, only by like five months. So five or eight, actually seven months. Oh, yeah, Candace. Candace is the youngest, right, of course. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. We also have joining us in Park Circle. You'll see these folks probably roll in here in a little bit. They had an appointment very early this morning. This is Joel and Lexi, um, Lexi DeFrancisco and Joel Mathis. They're joining us in Park Circle. They live in Park Circle. Um, They're definitely Park Circle agents. They have a lot of um, deals and partnerships in Park Circle. So we're pretty excited for them to join that office. You'll see them coming here on Thursday mornings, if not a little more often, um, but they will definitely be here for meetings going forward. They have a really big disc golf tournament that they do every year. So if you're interested in that, um, they've got it going on this Saturday. And then they have a little after party at Common House. And they said, anybody is welcome. So they would love to meet some of you guys. But I think you'll see them toward the end of the meeting. So more to come on them. All right. So we've got some birthdays. We've got October 14th is Steve Smith's birthday. Also Val Kelly. That's today. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to Steve. He's usually here early. He's probably sleeping in on his birthday. Val Kelly, I know, is closing on a house in Virginia that she has been working on for a long time. It's her own investment property. She said to me yesterday, I am not making any money, but I won't be losing money anymore because she bought it two months before the market crashed. So she's finally recovering from that. She has the best birthday present she could possibly get. So happy birthday to them. Duval, your birthday is coming up on the 18th. Happy birthday to you. And then on the 19th, we have Paige Pollock's birthday. So happy birthday to you guys. We have a lot of agents celebrating October anniversaries. This is anniversary with Carolina One. We've got Collier and Cindy. So, oh, excuse me. Collier celebrating one year. Cindy and Karen celebrating two years. Michelle Gethers, I believe, is also at that two-year mark. Jeannie Axel and Laura Goolsby celebrating eight years with Carolina One. Lisa Rivers, 11 years. Gail Young, 15 years with Carolina One. Rini Kramer, 16 with Carolina One. Peggy Lee, 18 years. And Mary Guest, 30 years with Carolina One. That is pretty darn cool. That is awesome. Isn't that crazy to think about that. Like 18 years working, 30 years working. It's just nuts. Very crazy. Huh? I know, it's one location. My mom has lived in the same town her whole life. 67 years. That's a long time to live in the same place. I'm like, don't you want to move to Charleston? <laughs> wrong with you. All right, so we've got a guess who. Here's our fun facts that you can kind of chew on the rest of the meeting. Throw some people up in the chat box there. This person previously worked on the 9-11 litigation team of prominent local of a prominent local firm. Married the same man twice. <laughs> Extra sure about that decision. I went to a college that I never saw beforehand 800 miles away from home. Gave a first lady a tour of where I was once living and has lived in 18 different homes and five different states. Right? <laughs> Laura Goolsby, I could see that. Let's see if we have anything in the chat box. <laughs> John Nugent said, are we only recruiting agents named Lexi? <laughs> yes, that's it, that's it. Um, yeah, market share on all the Lexis. <laughs> So we'll come back to this, but I guess this one's got you guys pretty stumped. I must say I was very surprised. I obviously know who it is, but I was very surprised. Hmm. Hmm. All right, upcoming, upcoming events. Um, October 
12 week year. We're doing that every Monday. So you guys know that we don't have to talk through that. We'll talk about it in a second. We've got October birthday lunch next week, hosted by Long Point Mortgage Experts, which we do every month for all the agents whose birthdays are in that month. Yes, please RSVP if you haven't already. We have a lot of October birthdays, I feel like. Um, we're having a wine party um, because I know somebody who sells wine. And we're going to do that at the Oyster Point Clubhouse, I believe. Melissa is um, looking into that for us, and we thought that would be a cool atmosphere outside, have a fireplace going be really fun. So we're going to do that next Friday. More to come on that. Fall Festival Block Party at East Montague is happening on the 23rd, which is a Saturday. I'll send that to you guys, or I'll show you guys here in a second. We'll probably just have our agents out there doing something. We're, we're not really sure what to expect, so it's not going to be much from a Carolina One presence, but just so you guys know, a community event, if you want to send out to your clients or if you want to attend, you're welcome to do that. Carolyn, you have a question mark? Friday. Did I say Thursday? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, it is the 22nd. You're right. Um, thank you. I'll adjust that. And then, of course, we have our carnival here um, on the 28th. So the fall festival, this is the one in Park Circle. This is Saturday the, the 23rd from 4 to 7. They block off the whole street on East Montague and all the businesses kind of do stuff. And then you've got a contest for um, costumes and you've got all kinds of fun stuff. So Park Circle is a hip little eclectic place like that. So I'll send this out to you guys. For our ha Halloween carnival on the 28th, I'm going to share this document with you guys today. We have a lot of big attractions that we're doing this year because of COVID. We're trying not to do any games where the kids will be in little clusters all together. So we're instead doing a lot of big attractions. So we've got a slide, you know, that big blow up slide that every kid sees and has to get on and mom and dad can't drive past it without stopping. We've got um, snakes that we're working on, like big, like scary snakes <laughs> yeah Kimberly Ritter knows somebody who does this I guess they have like pet snakes so we're pretty excited about that um cotton candy machine we talked to Ace yesterday she's always done that for us so we're waiting for her to let us know we've got a balloon lady who's available um we also have Melissa Loy has a photo booth thing with props so she's gonna do that we have we're gonna do stick on tattoos we're looking for a popcorn machine to do popcorn and witch's brew for a little snack or something. We're going to have candy bags so people aren't, they're going to actually leave with a pre-packaged bag of candy. The kids won't be like digging their hands in things to look for get candy or anything like that. And then the only game stuff that we're going to do probably is like pumpkin bowling and the witch toss because, or the ring toss on the witch hats because that's distance and not crowd. So we're going to need a lot of help with that stuff. This obviously wasn't done yesterday with pricing on it, but we have a lot of these things are obviously costing money. The snakes, I think, are $4.50, so we need, or maybe $5.50. So we need a couple of agents to split that. We need somebody to sponsor the balloon lady. Cotton candy, I think, will be good. So more to come on that, but just be mindful. And then we'll probably have everybody throw in 5 or 10 bucks for the um, candy and the little mishmash stuff that we do. Good? And, of course, costumes. We're expected to wear costumes. Okay. Moving forward. A week year. I love that little kid. Getting pumped up. It's my nephew. No, just kidding. Um, we've actually got three weeks to go on this. We did 12 weeks and we condensed it into um, six weeks because we know that this time of year is a little bit tough to get commitments, especially with the holidays coming up. Our focus so far each week the first week, we obviously created our goals and we kind of went through the whole process of what is 12 week year and the whole concept. Then we identified our tactics that will help us get to our goals. We created hot and warm lists so that we know we actually have people to go do that thing with. We did real estate reviews that were very simple this week, which I think was a pretty powerful one. I think most of you guys got that. Next week, we might do something to enhance real estate reviews because obviously we need listings. We really want to finish the last quarter of this year strong especially on the listing side going into the first quarter will really have an impact on the listings if we work on those real estate reviews now. Good. Only thing I can tell you on this, we started out 12 week year, and this is so typical just in any situation with I think 29 of you. And guess how many we had showing up this week? I wish. <laughs> Duval said 32. Um, like I think it was 17. So you can't do good work if you don't show up. If you've slacked off or you've missed because you've had appointments because you're busy, I get that. Just dive back in. Show up on Monday, 1030. 
get back in the saddle and let's go. We've got 12 more weeks left in the year. So if we can finish three more weeks of intensity on something, I believe in you guys. I feel like we can do it. All right. We've talked about COVID enough. I'm sure you guys know what it is. Um, Columbia agents, just a reminder in here, we've got Nia, who is a member of our Columbia MLS. So if you have somebody looking in that area, reach out to Nia. She'll partner with you on it. And then also Myrtle Beach, Polly's Island, Litchfield, that area. We've got Jill Burke up there, which I'm pretty sure you guys know on both fronts. But just a reminder, reach out to them for somebody there. They'll partner with you. Smooth, easy, just an extra transaction. Century Lock, you guys are aware of this. We don't have to hammer this in, but if you don't have the app on your phone yet and you don't know how to get the app on your phone, ask Tony and Alyssa to help you. Um, they know how to download it from the store for you, the app store, but you definitely need that because your Century Lock card is not going to work in a few months. So get the app. It's also less expensive. It's only $75 a year instead of $125. Okay, office exclusive questions. We're not going to hammer through this because we've done this a bunch. Um, but do you guys have any questions now that this has been shaking out for a couple of weeks on the office exclusive stuff? Don't overwhelm me. You get it? You got the fines? So far, we haven't received one. <laughs> but we will see. Right away. Yeah, we have two that we've disputed and we've been fine with. Um, but the biggest thing that they look, seem to be cracking down on, even Joseph Colum is watching very attentively um, because he's emailed me twice, which is not fun when Joseph emails you. I'm like, oh gosh, somebody screwed up a MLS rule. Um, but we, we're not sending the office exclusive form into them in time. So that form has to be sent to MLS within 24 hours of your client signing it. Good. I would assume it's business. I'll double check. I have an email drafted already to send out to you guys. So it's new. It's an adjustment. I know it's just another layer of complexity to our business. We just got roll with it. You guys have done a pretty good job. So yeah. All right. Um, that is last week's because I forgot to update it. October stats for the month so far. So we've got 12 listings at 8.1 million average price of 706. We've got 28 sales for 13.2 million average price of 474 and 29 closings for 18.8 .8 million average price of 649. Nice averages, especially that listing average. So far on the board for the month of October, we've got Alex Johnson, we've got Alex Teregas. Got Ashley Svedston, Bonnie Cook with two, Casey Benton, David Thompson, Davis and Rivers Group with two, Derek Hunter with two, Dominique Snyder House with two, Doug Gepford, Fessler Team with seven. They're really strong on the listings this month. Gail Young, Homes of the Low Country two, Jason Looney, Jeff Cloth, Jen Huffman two, John and Elaine Nugent, Justin Stewart, Karen Taz two, Katrina Johnson two. Lauren Zerilla, four, the Leet Ran team, Leslie Evans, McKay Bercozzi Group, Melissa Lloyd, two, Nia Swinton Jenkins, four, Pam Bishop, two, Patty Vick team, oops, sorry, Poppy team, Patty Vick, Rini Kramer team with two, Carrie Walker Group with two, Northrop team with six, very exciting, Perella Group with three, the Ritter Group, Tina Hartford, Tyler Davidson, and Val Kelly with two. So thank you guys very much. That's awesome. All right, partnerships. We are going to hear from Sheila here in a second on global. And you like that picture. <laughs> I like that picture. Um, I have your slides here if you want to have them to flip. I can't see anyway. So. Which one do you? There you go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Wow, there's a lot more people here than the last time I was here. This yeah. is great to see. You like to show up. I know. Um, and I actually see a lot of faces that I don't know. So for those that don't know me, I am uh, the office administrative coordinator for the company. I started back in 2005 when I moved here from Wilmington, North Carolina. And I started at the Mount Pleasant North location. I was there for 12 years before I took this position about six years ago. So I also work on special projects, one of them being global warranty. John trying to help promote that. Uh, I'm out of Salt Point, uh, right there in the hall behind Teresa. So if you're ever at Salt Point, come and say hello. 
and I do stop by here quite a bit. So <laughs> uh, it's on my way home. So sometimes I'll just come by and say, hey, or grab the girls, um, get some dinner or something. So I'm always around. Um, so let's just get started. Um, I wanted to just kind of take a second and just remind everybody, why do we even have a warranty? Um, why is it important? Um, and I'll start with um, one of the biggest things that is good to because it competes with new construction, which currently is 37% of homes sold. That number might be a little more, a little less. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, it also reduces the risk of problems after closings. 66% um, of people report failure of a major medical system within mechanical system within one year of closing. Um, it also, it increases buyer confidence and helps clients save money on repairs. Um, and as we all know, whenever a buyer purchases that, usually they're tight on money. So if they have a major something happen, it does help to have that warranty as a it's security. So their cost is not as much as if they didn't have it. And also, did you know they can choose their own contractor, their own vendor? Um, global pays market rates, which protects the home ownership, the homeowner from overpaying. Um, buyers also can purchase a policy up to 30 days after closing. It also makes a great closing gift. So in this market, we all know that we're not asking the seller to pay for the warranty as we have in the past. So they're not doing it. But we really just need to make sure that our buyers know that there is an option out there for a home warranty because it is important for them to have the coverage that there's another option. They can pay for it themselves or you can obviously give it to them as a closing gift as well. So these are just some thoughts to keep in mind. Thirty days within closing. Because can't buy it like, like I can't buy for my house right now. You probably could. As yeah. A, as, yeah. As, as a like global thing. model, it's not yeah. global model is attached to a sale, not to yeah. like advertising. Yeah. Like yeah. Like somebody, unless it's within a sale, they can't just go buy a global. And they only work for the state sale. You're an agent yeah, with our company. Our yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're special. special. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we kind of like to point this one out because this is what we recommend as a company. We think this is an overall good choice for your clients because it includes all of the major home appliances and it saves a little bit of money. The platinum plan, which is six twenty five, dollars and if you add the home inspection coverage for $70, that cost is six ninety five. dollars So it's under seven, very comparable with the old, pot, the old company that we used to have. Um, and it's a good overall coverage. Um, but make sure that you guys are referring to that global home warranty brochure. We have them in the office. We also have them on zip forms. They are available. Um, make sure that you give it to your client. Let your client make the choice whether they warranty or not. Don't assume that they might not care about having a warranty. So please make sure that, it, that you guys are discussing it. And we also have started... Um, I'm calling it our training videos on terms and conditions. Um, as we all know, in that brochure, there is a lot of words in that brochure for terms and conditions, and it can be very confusing. So we are working on uh, breaking that down a little bit for y'all into sections. And right now there are three that are uh, that you can get to by clicking on uh, this library of warranty in rows under their, the service page of Global. There's the one for the Central Air, the central heat and also the home inspection um, coverage. And it just breaks it down for you a little bit easier to understand. Okay. And if you guys have any questions, we are here for you. The um, Tony and Alyssa are available. I'm always available. And then Dwayne, he is the vice president, the executive vice president of Global. Here's his phone number, his email. He does answer the phone. He does respond rather quickly. So if you're unsure about anything, please reach out and uh, let us know. And it's certainly if you have any questions. Yeah, we should probably email out soon. Oh, yeah, we can do that. No problem. He yes, ma'am. you're welcome to call him. Okay. And we're waiting for him to regret that. <laughs> so far, he hasn't done that. He's regretting it. <laughs> I just throw in for comment. Uh, something that we get asked for a lot is um, feedback. 
Global, I think a lot of the agents uh, since we switched vendor partners have um, kind of taken a wait to see attitude to see how I guess we definitely had some problems with the fire vendor, see how these guys do. And I don't think positive feedback is how warranty works. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> uh, if you buy a warranty, you expect something to get fixed. Uh, you don't bother reading the terms and conditions. And then when the terms and conditions come into play, you get mad, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the homeowner. And so uh, how I think, and I, I'm the warranty escalation guy, I've managed to insert you into the process. But I'm the ultimate yes. uh, warranty escalation guy for the company. I work with a fire vendor, I am a global. Uh, and what I would tell you is that we get, we, we were probably in the one a week, so to two or three in a two week span, really ugly situations, particularly in HVAC season. Uh, with our fire uh, fire vendor, uh, and I believe we have had seven escalations all year. Uh, with one was our fire vendor, just a legacy policy right. that was still in effect with them. Um, five were HVAC, and now we have a plumbing, plumbing issue, issue, largely because we can't get a vendor out there in a reasonable time frame. Right. Uh, but that's it, you know, in a year that's set, as that's opposed nice. to in a year previously, I would have had seventy, yes. eighty, probably. So I'm not getting, hey, I love global. I think because if it works, it's just meeting people's minimum expectations, right? They don't say, hey, this is great, it worked. Uh, but what I'm what I'm not getting is the like arm waving hysteria, uh, you know, about a vendor from Georgia not wearing a shirt showing up to fix my <laughs> HPC and then not coming back the next day when you didn't fix it the first time and I've had to pay 17 vendor service call fees. <laughs> You know, I'm not, I'm, it I'm actually not happens. That stuff. So I'm choosing to believe that while not perfect, uh, because no vendor is ever going to get home warranty because it's an interesting, uh, an interesting product. Um, I, I'm choosing to believe that that may be really Yeah. Um, the other thing to remember on global is Alyssa made this slide. We had to send it out to you guys. I said I would do that. Um, Tony, if you're listening to me, make a note for us to send these slides, but keep in mind that the girls order it for you. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do anything extra other than just fill out the form signaling to them that you want a warranty and the girls will take care of ordering it, getting you the invoice. So you have the, um, policy number, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So they're happy to do it. They're happy to answer questions. If you're on the road and you're running into an appointment, but you have a global question and they can't answer it, they'll call Dwayne for you and get the answer to the question and then call you back. I know that yesterday and a couple of times this week, Clark Coker has an HVAC on a property with Ed Honeycutt and the HVAC is like 32 years old. And he's talked to Dwayne like five or six times and the resolution because they can't agree on a cost concession to cover the risk for the buyer because it's working. Um, what's his name? Ed and Greg are going to, I mean, Clark, goodness gracious, are going to split the cost of a warranty for the buyers. And they're doing it for two years. So they've talked to Dwayne a bunch of times. Clark's like, he's great. He actually answers his phone. I'm like, I know, I told you. So it's definitely helpful to have that relationship. But keep in mind, the girls can help you and be that link as well. He is from Chicago. So he has ruffled a few of our agents. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when Here's they call in and they wish the warranty covered something that it clearly doesn't cover, he doesn't give you the South Carolina Charleston, <laughs> lots of bows. Here's why it's okay. So it's like, nah, that's not covered. Read it right here. Line 16. <laughs> so when you, so it, he, he can definitely, uh, he can definitely rub you the wrong way, but uh, he's, he's a really solid guy and it's hard for the right. Yeah. Way. And he works hard. You the wrong way, call me and I'll have him call you back. <laughs> <laughs> With a feather, yeah. bow, yeah. glitter, whatever. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, we appreciate you being here. All right, Dave, talk to us about some numbers. Oh, okay. Favorite, yes, I uh, actually do like this. Um, good morning, uh, glad to be here as always. Uh, I uh, the last time I was here, I think we talked about uh, recruiting and retention a little bit, uh, so uh, chose to go into the market. I hate this picture, I, I hate all of them actually. Uh, how do I advance? No, you can't, you can't. Stay like that. Oh, does it? So I need to stop pressing things, all right. And then to advance now, I do that. Okay, great. So now I can touch now it. You can. All right, great. All right. So um, I just want to talk about a few of the, the slides that we send out uh, pretty regularly. I missed last week, uh, and I'm behind on getting the monthly update out for this this month. And I frankly have no idea when it's going to happen. 
Um, the um, first slide that we that we send out, we send this one out on pretty much a weekly basis, uh, deals with ratified contracts in the market week by week for the last three years. Used to only do it for two. Um, I don't like graphs with three sets of lines on them, uh, particularly for non-numbers people. You lose them at one set of numbers. Uh, you, so let's say you lose 20% of the people when you start talking about numbers at all. Um, you, you lose about half to two-thirds of them when you add in a second line. Uh, and when you add in a third line, you've lost like 90%. Um, so this year we chose to confuse 90% of our people and 90% of our clients by having three lines uh, on the chart. But there's a reason we have three lines on the chart. So the, the green line is this year's ratified contracts by week. The orange line is last year's ratified contracts by week. And 2019 is, uh, I'm sorry, the blue line is 2019's ratified contracts by week. So let's start with question one. Why did we choose three lines this year instead of just two? Because last year was nuts. Yeah, so last year was nuts on two fronts. Well, three if you count the lockdown, like I forgot about the lockdown, like that's normal. Um, so if you if you take out the lockdown, there were two other things that were crazy about last year. Any idea what they were in terms of number of contracts? Talking about number of contracts? What were what were two, there were two things that were crazy? There were a lot. So there were way, way more than, than a typical year. Uh, there were 48,000 transaction sides that closed last year. Um, the median for the last 20 some odd years is like 31,000. So, you know, it was a gigantic year. Um, the second thing is seasonality went out the window. I mean, every year from the dawn of time, you could more or less say exactly what percentage of the year's closings were going to occur in every month. You know, March is an 8% month. April is an 11% month. And I, I mean, I, I had these things memorized. Last year, all gone. Uh, particularly the fourth quarter. We sort of accelerated into the fourth quarter when we typically drop off the edge of a cliff. So um, we put 2019 in there to give you an idea of what how this year looks relative to a normal year, not relative to last year. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, bear in mind, 2019 was, I believe, the third best year uh, ever in the history of Charleston real estate. Um, so it's not like 2019. When I say it was a normal year, it had normal seasonality with a very high level of contracts and closings. So it, but it still was way more normal than last year. Make sense? Okay. Why do we track ratified contracts and not closings? The very important reason, which basically nullifies every headline you'll ever read. You can determine the momentum. So think about the life cycle of a real estate sale. Which happened more recently, the closing or the ratified contract? Which one happened last week? Which one happened six weeks ago? The ratified contract happened last week, right? I'm sorry. Well, I, I guess I screwed that up. That's why everybody's confused. The ratified contract, we can track last week, and that tells you what the closings will be in four to six weeks. Does that make sense? The closings tell you what ratified contracts were four to six weeks ago. The forward-looking indicator, the closest you can get, is a ratified contract. So when you're talking about closings, you're talking about what consumer sentiment was four to six to eight weeks ago. Who cares? Because that was that's that in in the housing market that can be ancient history. So anytime you're reading about closings, you're reading somebody that doesn't understand the process, post and courier, of a real estate transaction. Does that make sense? So ratified contracts tells you what consumer sentiment was last week. Closings tell you what consumer sentiment was four to six to eight weeks ago when that ratified. Um, you get in, I get into people that want to pick apart that decision. Usually they'll go to fall throughs. Well, what about fall throughs? Yeah, they're the same forever. They're 12 to 18% of written sales, good market, bad market. Um, all that changes really is two things. Why they fall apart is different in different markets. And how many of them happen to a couple of vocal agents in an office in a given week? So if a couple of vocal agents in an office have a bunch of fall throughs, they think the sky is falling and they tell everybody else the sky is falling. And pretty soon the agents in that office believe the sky is falling and everybody's backing out of their deals. Never been true. Not from a macro perspective. Make sense? Okay. Now you can have little things that happen. Well, I say little. Okay. I better pick a different example before I say that was little. 
Um, I can't, literally can't think of one. Uh, so you could have something bad happen uh, that is a big and scary in the news. Uh, and that can cause a momentary everybody backs out of their deals. So when I say it never happens, I don't I don't mean there's not tiny little blips in time, but usually it's something that works itself out in a month or so. You know, so there might be a, a, a let's say a terrorist attack and everybody gets scared and then you have a bunch of people back out of deals. But a month later, two months later, most of the markets return to normal. So that 12 to 18 percent number for fall throughs is is uh, we've never been more, never been less uh, in my years of tracking it, uh, which go back to the mid 2000s. Make sense? OK. Any questions on this? I'm going to point out a couple of things before Does I move that off. Does fall through comment surprise you guys or not surprise you guys? So high that it hasn't changed. I would, I'm surprised that 12 to 18 is always going to be 5 to 8. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's consistently in the 12 to 18% range. I feel like, like what James was saying, though, a lot of times we get caught up and we feel like, Oh my gosh, every contract on fire. Everybody's having fall through. But really, instead of. Should they bring the pandemic? Does that, does that increase at all? Yes, for, for, for about 30 days, it increased significantly. And then within about 60 days, it was right back where it was. I believe that's because you guys do such a good job. You probably have no fall through. Yeah, I'm not a piece of the other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to spend any more time on that piece of it. Just wanted to kind of explain why we track ratified contracts and not closings. It's, 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 yes. Yeah, so the question, the question is, uh, do we see a difference in price ranges? To the extent that we track it, which it's, it's you know, at some point you're tracking so many things, there's no time to do anything but track things. Uh, but I'll say this, uh, the, the top price, the high end, tends to be the squirreliest. So it, it, if you think of it as the first thing to go cold when the market shifts and the last thing to get hot when the market's been running for a while, um, the same thing happens on the on the contract side when, when there's an event, particularly if it hits the stock market, um, you see people back out of, of uh, high-end deals at a much higher rate than you see them back out of, of you know, normal, regular, work-a-day people deals. Make sense? Good question. Okay, so the thing I would point out for this year is how high the green line is. You know, this is this will be the second best year in Charleston real estate history. Um, it will, if last year was around 48,000 transaction sides, we'll probably finish very close to that. This year, probably in the 45 to 47,000 range, depending on exactly what happens in the last couple months. Um, so it cannot be understated uh, the, the, that, that this year is exceptional. Uh, we are also, if you look at contracts relative to the blue, which is a normal year, we, we had the best, I'm sorry, second best September ever uh, in terms of written sales in our market. So I've heard agents say the market's shifting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's different than the summer. So what I think we're seeing is the seasonal slowdown and it, the market feels different than it did in July because it's not July but it's the second best September ever. So is the market shifting? Maybe a little bit, but I think it's just seasonality. So if you look at inventory as an example, uh, inventory bottomed out around 1400 listings, went back up to about 2000, which sounds like it added a lot of listings, but bear in mind that in the last boom bust, we got as low as 4,000 listings and two years later, we're at 10,000. So that was 6,000 listings in a 24 month span. So to go up 600 in a six month span is nothing. It's now backed off, back down to about 1800 or a little under 1800 in the high 1700s. So inventory has started eroding again. Um, so that suggests to me that we're not in the middle of some big shift. Uh, what I would say about market shifts, the, the, the seasonality, it happens every year. That's why they call it seasonality. And one of the things I thought was funny when I was a broker uh, at, uh, at Coleman, uh, about the second or third year I was a broker, I realized that about the beginning of October every year, uh, there would be a line of agents outside my door telling me the market was falling apart. 
Uh, and the first couple of years, I was like, crap, there's like 20 people all telling me this and they're out there doing it. I'm not. They must be right. The market's falling apart. Then I started realizing it happened every year and the numbers were about the same as they were the year before. And all it was, was it felt different than the summer and the spring because it's no longer the summer and the spring and that there would be a summer and a spring next year. So I started to understand how like ancient societies develop these rituals around the harvest where they like throw somebody in a volcano to make sure that you know, things would come back next year, even though it had come back for the last 400 years, they were so worried that it wasn't going to come back next year. So I really hope realtors don't start sacrificing people to make sure that the market comes back next year in the spring. <laughs> as long as it's not me. Yes. hundred percent. You guys can throw whoever you want in the volcano. Um, all right. So there is seasonality. The business is my point. So I think what we're seeing right now in the second best September ever is it feels different than the summer and that's just the seasonality. Uh, I would also point out that the median number, remember median is middle, not average. Um, the median number of contracts written over the last 20 years in a week in September is 271. We did not have one week under 400 this September. So it's, it's, it's a bananas market for September. I remember when we used to say 200 was great. Yeah, we were like, 300 was amazing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 been an amazing, uh, amazing September, to say the least. Uh, one of the other things to remember is the headlines are going to be closings down by 10 percent, uh, 15 percent, whatever they were in September. Yeah, that makes sense, because last year was nuts. So closings were down, but it's still the best, second best September we've ever had. We have declining inventory at a ridiculously low level uh, and and we, we still have really good market momentum. Questions or comments before I move off to another point? And I'm allowed to touch the computer now, so I will do that. Okay. Um, this is the uh, number of listings taken by month for the last 12 months. Uh, with the orange line is the most recent 12 months. The blue line is preceding 12 months. Uh, and the point is that we're talking about low inventory. But we are taking more listings as a, as a market than we ever have. So... You know, you hear one of the things that drives me crazy uh, as a numbers purist uh, is when people say there's way too many realtors because there's only one listing for every seven realtors. OK, well, that's not actually true. So in the last 12 months, we've taken 26,000 listings, which would be about four listings for every realtor. That just means that there's only one or, or one seventh of one or whatever the number works out to one sixth of one currently. So how do you get there? Anybody that's lived in an area where it snows, um, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but uh, having having done it myself, the um, uh, if you've ever lived in an area where it snows and the ground is warm, it can snow really hard when the ground is warm and you're not going to have any accumulation. Right. Anybody seen this? Right. That's what's happening. It is snowing like hell. We're taking more listings than we ever had. There's just so much demand that it's not accumulating. We're burning through it before it has a chance to build up and accumulate. So people that tell you that, that there's not listings out there to be had, numerically ignorant, but okay, they can believe it. It's not true. And that's an important, an important message to deliver to your buyers that are losing hope. This is the most listings we've ever had. We're just not getting them. And you got to be fast and move into it. That's right. So you have to, the way to get there obviously is to have every, um, use every tool at your advantage. Now to make you feel better, and, and I don't know why this would, but um, I was just at a, uh, I was just at a, a so right. I was just at a conference, uh, at Realty Alliance, where we get together with other large companies and just talk things through. And one, one of them, I, I don't know, there's stuff that I, I guess you just have to have the right relationship with your people. I feel like if we did this, we, we'd have a problem. Um, so they had a, uh, they had a, they had a biggest loser contest. Uh, which was uh, a, a, a reward for the agent and the buyer. I don't remember what the prize was, but it was substantial, like to try to make the buyer feel better. For the one buyer and agent that missed on the most houses with actual verifiable written offers. And they had somebody that missed on 38 houses. And here's the thing. They didn't fire their agent. Like that was the part I couldn't believe. I mean, I felt like at least when I was an agent at like two, I got fired. You know, so how you survive to... 38. I don't know. So anyway, there's if what's that? 
I don't know. I was too shocked at the number to think to ask the question. I thought of it later, but um, so if you're not at 38, I guess the point is it can always get worse. All right. So um, did that make you feel better? Uh, so the uh, the other thing I would, uh, the, the next slide, uh, this really just talks uh, about absorption rate uh, in the most active MLS areas. So there's like nine or 10 MLS areas that represent almost 70% of all the activity in the MLS. There's like another 27 that really don't have that much activity. So if you look at the inventory, amount of inventory uh, in these areas, the total MLS is at 0.9 months. Anybody remember what a balanced market is? Six. And what happens to prices in a balanced market? They're stable, right? They might go up a little bit. They might stagnate but they're pretty much stable at six months. What happens below six months? Prices go up. And the further below six months you get, the faster they, they go up, right? So, so that when you're at 0.9, uh, you, prices are gonna go up pretty quick. Uh, and the most active MLS areas, which includes uh, MLS 42, uh, and, and if I expand it out just a little bit, 41, are all in roughly the two weeks worth of inventory range. And remember, that's all price ranges. So, you know, when you're in the two million plus range, there's more than two weeks worth of inventory. You know, when you get down into the normal people price ranges, uh, it's uh, not anywhere near two weeks worth of inventory. Make sense? Okay. And that's still true even in the market right now. All right. Next one. This one is is takes a second to grasp, but I think this might, other than the ratified contracts, be the most important one. Uh, and this is the blue line is the number of listings in the market that are um, not that are active, excluding contingents and pendings. So these are unencumbered properties that you can actually go out and buy if you wanted to, theoretically. Um, there are uh, the, I don't have the September number up there yet, which is something was in the 1700, like 1775 range, uh, about 200 below the number there. But 1994 for the last number there. The yellow line is how many listings there would have to be based on that month's sales to have six months worth of inventory, which we just talked about being where prices stabilize. So people that are worried about imminent price declines, what would have to happen to these two lines for prices to stabilize? The blue line and the yellow line would have to intersect. They would have to meet in order for prices to stabilize stabilize. Forget about decline, forget about crater, forget about end of the world. To stabilize those two lines would have to meet. So the difference right now is about 11,000 listings between where we are and where we would need to be based on current demand for prices to stabilize. No, 11,000 more in total. Total. So we'd have to go from about 2,000 rough numbers to about 11,000. So to put it in perspective, the last boom cycle that ended in disaster, right? Historically unprecedented disaster. So there's a real good shot that whatever, whenever this boom cycle ends, it's not going to look like that. Uh, but, but that one uh, took about two years to go from 4,000 to 10,000 units for prices to stabilize. So we're at 2,000 units um, you know, even if we had a similar tail off like we did then, it might take two years for prices to really stabilize. Yes. No, I'm saying that that right now prices are where they are and that in order for them to stop rising stabilize, we would have to get another 10,000 or so listings based on today's sales levels. So what else can happen? What There are two things that can happen here to make that happen, right? The blue line can go up and the yellow line can come down. So if the yellow line is just the number of sales multiplied by six, what brings the yellow line down? If sales drop off, the yellow line can come down. Let's say sales dropped off by 30%, right? What happens to the yellow line? Goes from 12,000 to, well, let's just use a round number, an easier number, 25%. So we would go from 12,000 listings, yellow line to 9,000, right? Where are we? 2,000. So, it, and then if, if demand drops off by 
and there's you know 2,000 listings taken a month, that would mean we'd start adding about 500 or so listings a month. So if we added 500 a month and we needed to get to 9,000 from 2,000, that's 7,000 we'd have to add. That would take how long? 7,000 divided by 500 be 14. Take 14 months to get there. So even if sales drop by 25% and listings stay at a record pace, it'll take more than a year to get to the point where prices will stabilize. Does that make sense? Okay, so people who are waiting for next spring for prices to be better. It could. I mean, if your sales go to zero, that 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 uh, blue line will come up real quick. So, you know, if something spectacular happens. Yeah, they might be right. I mean, spectacularly bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, regular, normal economic cycle course of events kind of stuff. We're probably not looking at next spring before they stabilize. I don't think I don't think we can sustain the ridiculous. I mean, at one point this year, the year over year was 20 percent. I think now the year over year is like 12 or 13. That's still way too much because that's outpacing wages uh, very significantly. So there, I'm not saying there's no problems. That's not my point. What I'm saying is I, I keep and I'm kind of a long term optimist, short term pessimist always. Uh, I am not pessimistic in the short term. Um, I, you know, I, I think the next the next six to 12 months um, may not be maybe quite as crazy as the last two years, but they're still going to be really, really good. And I have a really hard time envisioning prices stabilizing uh, unless interest rates go absolutely bananas. That's the only thing I could see happening that would that would really turn this. And listings stayed at their current record pace. It would take about 14 months for prices and um, for prices to stabilize. Mm -hmm. Sure. When you're relying on me, that's bad. But go ahead. I was also at a conference and that's roughly what the, so the, the how long are we, so, so let me advance a couple slides. So let's, let's just go with that. Oh crap. There's supposed to be two more slides. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about two things um, that I don't have any visual representation to back up. Um, why why would this run what how did we get in such a ridiculous inventory imbalance and what gets us out of it uh let's you know forget and this is happening in many many parts of the country we are far from alone on this uh i, I think you can take places that we know are losing population california is a great example i mean that that place is is depopulating like a i don't know like like rats off a sinking ship uh, and and Texas, Idaho, Colorado, Oklahoma, they're getting crushed by Californians uh, and uh, uh, Utah. Um, the Their prices are still going up. So if you're trying to figure out how much of this price escalation is BS, I think you can kind of take a place like New York or California, look at their price escalation when we know that they're at least population stagnant and maybe population declining uh, and say, okay, that's sort of the interest rate gravy baseline price growth that we've seen. Uh, and then you can look at where we're at and the spread and say, that's probably, you know, what's legitimate price growth that we've seen in our market. That's not because of interest rates, it's because of people moving, that kind of stuff. So we're, if we're in the 20% range, California is in like the 13% range year over year growth. So I'd say we have about seven points worth of growth there, uh, you know, that that's legitimate above the interest rate piece of it. Um, when you get into to uh, why is this happening other than interest rates? So that's to me, obviously, interest rates are a big piece of this. Why else is this happening? Um, I have a slide on new construction 
over the by decade for the last 60 years. Uh, last year, last decade, there were about um, well over the last 20, we're almost 10 million houses short in terms of what should have been built. Most of that in the last decade. Why? What happened at what happened a decade or so ago that pretty much crippled home building? That's a secondary factor. So she said building moratorium. I think that's number two. Well, right. And then they couldn't get financed. So they pretty much all went bankrupt or almost bankrupt. Then they couldn't get financing. Nobody would lend the money, which choked off the three to five year process of buying and developing land. The second, so they, they were just, just by the fact all that happened, they lost five years. Then the next thing that, that uh, along with, with the building moratoriums, which, you know, are, are of the nimbyism, which I think is a questionable wisdom um, at best, the uh, next thing that happened was a lot of the small builders never came back. Wall Street would lend money to Lennar, right? They would, or they would underwrite debt for Lennar, but they wouldn't for the local guy that builds 50 a year or the regional guy that builds 250 a year. Those guys were almost wiped out and they've never really come back. So you had the projects delayed, you had the big builders crippled, and you had the little builders literally annihilated. So you end up with many millions short. So what allowed us to be many millions short? There's a particular group of people that may or may not include Maggie that basically delayed adulthood for a super long time. Right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So you have the largest, there it is, the largest generation in American history, the millennials. And they deferred, is there a previous, or, yeah, see, there's the, there's the single family housing units completed by decade. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And that decade delay is not because nobody wanted to build houses. It was a bunch of factors that came together and crushed those people. What masked it was these people, we're living with mom and dad, or they got like nine of them together and lived in an apartment somewhere, right? That's what math did, is they, they were not forming households. Now they're, they're getting their act together. They're having kids, they're forming households, uh, and, and they are adding, they are adding a... Uh, a oh, my friends. Yes, that's right. You picked a great time to stop selling. Um so the uh, so that there that group of people is now in household formation mode, uh, and it's the largest generation in American history. A wave cresting on a beach that's missing millions and millions and millions of houses. Throw a little crazy interest rates on top of it, and you got yourself a nice little explosion. So interest rates um, certainly are a giant bogey that I'm very concerned about. So if I had to pick something that's gonna, that could torpedo everything I just said, interest rates. Uh, but uh, uh, if the the government's going to continue to believe they can do what they're doing forever, which they've I've, for 15 years I've been saying this can't keep happening, and for 15 years I've been wrong. I've chosen to just keep saying the same thing till I die, just to see if I can be right once. Uh, so you know, it it uh, I, I suspect at some point they're going to have to deal with reality. But if not. I, I just don't see how this ends, which is well, at least anytime soon, because the millennials are going to keep forming households. It's a giant group of people, way bigger than my seven million more of them than my generation. So it's, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. So it's there are there are the other thing I would say is if you didn't watch the Charleston regional economic forecast uh, that CTAR did last week, watch it. Um, when you when they got into the industrial conversation and what's happening up 26 between here and 95, that they are basically out of land between here and 95 to develop industrially because it's all been bought just not developed yet uh but it's coming and, and so you add almost certain locally the local factor to add on top of all these national macro factors is um a, a healthy dose of nimbyism 
that's going to that's going to slow down residential development a huge amount of economic development coming in our supply problem isn't going to get fixed by the builders anytime soon and our demand problem is only going to continue to increase so how do you end up with charleston with a san francisco like average sales price this is how you do it so now, very, uh, the, the, the other thing I would say, and I always close with this because I, I've watched so many people talk over the years and just be flat wrong. I, I'm a guy with an opinion. That's it. So it's, you know, and I'm, I'm a guy with an opinion that doesn't have a bunch of letters after his name either. So, you know, if you're listening to me over those people, just think about it. But I mean, I, th this is the stuff I look at. I try to keep things simple. I think people overcomplicate. To, to arrive at long, wrong conclusions. If I'm going to arrive at a wrong conclusion, I'm going to do it without work and so So that's, that's, I'm trying to keep it simple and focus on the important stuff. That worries me, but yes, good. I don't trust those guys. I don't know much, but yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. Sorry, I almost gypped you on two slides. That's, yeah. Yes, very cool. I'll send it to you guys. And we did record it. So we'll blast it to the world so Dave can get all the credit. Leave it up there. This one. The millennial one. Yes. Good morning. So this right here is amazing. You basically just went through exactly what I was going to say, which is awesome. But I don't know if you all remember this, but I did a uh, presentation. I don't know. It was, I think it did probably in about October, about this time of last year, that was talking about the different generations and how they affect cycles. And it was just total, totally anecdotal. I don't have any actual scientific measure, but I was looking through it and it, the average home buyer's age for every generation is 33 years old. And that is at the end of the generation cycle, what I looked at was when they were 33 to 35 years old, that was the peak buying season for that that generation. We are at that point right now for about the next two or, th like two or three years that matches up perfectly with that three to five year window. But now where do I go? Hey, to that point, <laughs> What is inflation? What does inflation measure? Buying power. So if cost is going up, but you have fixed your cost, are you benefiting or is it a, is it bad? You're benefiting, right? If I buy something for 25 cents and prices continue to go up and I can sell it for 75 cents, then I've benefited. That's inflation. So what is the best hedge against inflation? real estate if you buy at the right time right rates right now specifically are still down i think again it was in january or february this year in fact it was when you were here early on in the first quarter we said what do we expect rates to be at the end of the year in october november four or four and a half we're not anywhere near that in fact they went back down a little bit they have ticked back up and everybody thinks that rates have gone crazy because it went up a quarter of a percent but they are like Three eighths off of the historic lows. We're still at a very low rate right now. And again, I've been saying the same thing my entire career. Eventually, rates have to go up. Like economic principles dictate that. I was talking to John Grisillo about this actually last week, and I asked him. I said, "Do you think this is going to continue to run the way it is, or uh, you know, this the all the money being pumped into the system is this going to cause inflation at some point?" And he said, "Well, it should, but right now the reason it hasn't, in his opinion, is that." The American dollar is still the safe haven asset for the entire world. As long as our dollar is what everybody turns to as a safe haven investment, then we can continue to print money without fail. You know, we can continue to kick that can down the road as long as our dollar is the strongest currency in the world. Right now, that's the case. More irresponsible with their money than us. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, but the point of all that is buy now, <laughs> right? Buy now. I'm not going to go through all this. Don't judge, though. <laughs> all 
I'm going to run through the thank yous real quick. Thank yous were closings last week. Nia Swinton Jenkins and Carrie Walker. Uh, new contracts is Duval Acker. Uh, Pre approvals is Mary Maloney, Duval Acker, Kimberly Ritter, and Nia Swinton Jenkins. And then inquiries were Laura Goolsby, Justin Stewart, Paul Lynch, Nia Swinton Jenkins, Cindy Ellenberger, Greg Fessler, Tina Byers Campbell, Pam Bishop, Jeff Cloth, and Tom DiLorenzo. Thank you all. Any questions on anything? All right. All right, we've got two on real caravan. We have one for DI's office and one for us, Peggy Leet's listing. We have two new listings. Um, I don't think Rick or Clark are on here to tell us about Daryl Creek. Let me just check and see. That is um, obviously a very big and nice house. I don't see them. Um, four beds, five baths. Five beds, four baths. Four and a half baths. You guys can read it. 3,000 square feet. Daryl Creek, 979. Looks like a pretty nice house. So reach out to them if you've got a buyer for Daryl Creek. Pam has a new listing on third. Four bedrooms, two and a half baths, 1750 square feet in Eagle Run. That is Hanahan, I believe, right? Maybe? I don't know. We're going to start putting the cities on here. And any have wants or needs that you guys want to share before we do our guess who and head out on caravan? Kimberly Ritter, I see your hand first. What you got? Oh, that's a good one. All right. Um, let me read these on the chat box before I miss them. Thorne has one going live today on James Island, a 4-3, 1926 square feet. Don't you have somebody, James Island, Alex? Um, 0.28 of an acre, no HOA, 450. Yep, sounds like it's going to go pretty quick. They also need to buy a Mount Pleasant, um, 3-2, 1,500 square feet, very flexible, up to 600. Leslie Evans has a Daniel Island need under 425. And Goolsby, you got something? Awesome. Horn. Horn. Okay. Who else? He did. Okay, thank you. Um, Justin has a renter need. 20 to 25 days to find a house. They need four bedrooms, minimum three bath. Closer to Seabrook, the better. Please let him know if you have anything. I assume that budget is uh, undetermined at the moment. Justin is on a plane. Kimberly, another one? Um, another need that's been a need for a while, but now they are pre-approved without selling their house. Okay. Where else? Home runs? One twice. Let's do our guess who. Make sure Lexi has a ride on caravan if she would like to attend. And our other Lexi and Joel, they did not arrive, but you'll see them probably in two weeks. I know they're out of town next week. Um, but our guess who, this is a good one, stumped y'all. Previously worked on the on a 9-11 litigation team of a prominent local firm, married the same man twice, went to a college that she never saw before 800 miles away, gave a first lady a tour of where she was once living and lived in 18 homes in five different states. Andrew, guess. Sure. Sherry Alford. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nancy Carol, Carol Crick. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Not Nia. Kristen nope. Not Kristen Davis. <laughs> Not Leah Fry. Are you ready? Yes. It is Kristen Ackerman. 
That is so awesome. I'm pretty tight with Kristen. She's from my hometown, and I still didn't know any of that. How bad is that? I knew she married Doug twice, actually. That's pretty cool. Kristen, um, you got to explain one of these, though. Um, who's the first lady? Huh? Where? That's pretty cool. She married him once in Hawaii and once in America. Oh, wait. Hawaii is in America. <laughs> I meant in South Carolina, right? It was in South Carolina the second time? Not in America. Yeah. Yeah. Our big island. Um, and the 9-11 litigation thing, that was, um, had to have been kind of recent. Oh, yeah. I did know that. Crazy. Very cool. Cool stuff. The things we learn, right? And there's her husband that she married twice. Doug. Retired Air Force. So very cool. Thanks for playing. Thanks for being here, guys. Let's head out on Caravan. Thanks for everything you do for our clients. Have an awesome day, an awesome weekend. See y'all.